This is the Serial at Midnight Podcast. Alrighty guys, welcome back to the Serial and Midnight Podcast. My name is Heath Holland, and this is another one of those looks at how the magic is made. We're talking about the inside scoop on physical media, one of those production interviews. I'm talking to Adam J. Yeend, who is a senior project manager. He has worked for a variety of different studios and distributors, Warner Brothers, 20th Century Fox, Disney, Criterion. Now, he was at 20th Century Fox when the Disney acquisition happened. And that's one of the things I wanted to talk to him about is what was it like to be on the inside of that when you were, you'd been at 20th Century Fox for years and then Disney buys 20th Century Fox. There's this merge. What was that like from the inside? So that was, that's, that alone is an incredible conversation. But he's also, he, he has, he worked on the True Lies and the Abyss releases that were highly publicized uh, just in the last month or so as this video or conversation is going up. Uh, and but So we're going to talk about all of that. But in the course of this conversation, what I need to make abundantly clear is that Adam is not representing any studio or entity. He is only representing himself. So Adam does not represent Disney or Criterion or Fox or Warner Brothers or any of the people that he's worked for. He is here as himself take his opinions as his own. Okay, we got, we got it, right? I, I have to be very explicit with this, that this conversation is not representative of any corporate entity. It is representative only of himself, and these are his opinions. That being said, there's some incredible insight here. I mean, incredible insight that really shows uh, where things are, not just physical media, but also digital, and also just the entertainment industry as a whole, this goes to some really interesting places, some 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 uncomfortable places. Some like as somebody who loves Hollywood, I'm like, what is going on? We're gonna talk about all of that. So, I had a blast with this conversation. I had uh, it's just a real joy, and I hope that you get joy out of this as well. Because the more we can learn about the hobby that we love so much, just the entertainment industry in general, the more we can learn about it, the better fans we can be the more active we can be in our fandom. So I'm not going to come back at the end of this video to bookend it with any more, uh, with like a closing statement or anything. Thanks to Adam. Thanks to you guys. Without further ado, Adam J. Yeend. So how did you end up going from Australia to Hollywood? They kind of walk me through that. Yeah, I uh, started in uh, Australia. I was an actor and um, that's what brought me here. Um, <clears throat> always a uh, huge cinephile and... Um, always had a you know video and dvd collection when i was growing up as a kid vhs and systematically replaced the vhs's with dvds and was obsessed with like the, the bonus features and everything like that and um it's interesting like for all of the um acting opportunities um there was still always this sort of connection in la that happened where i was meeting people in the industry from different facets of it you know got to work at the oscars one year uh worked at um trailer park which is a um you know, places that makes all the movie trailers, but they also did all the DVD menus when they were doing really fancy, like the Alien set. I was there at Trailer Park for that. And um, I also then, you know, just kept meeting people. Uh, and so I got to experience so many different facets of the business, not only in front of the camera, but then also behind. And all these questions I had as a kid eventually got answered. And, um, and then uh, by chance I needed some more steady income uh and i met uh who became my boss at 20th century fox home entertainment um at a, at a girlfriend's party and uh at a bachelorette party and um hold on you met someone from fox at a bachelorette party i mean this is la man like you know like it's like it, it was crazy um and I, I thought like it was just nothing and then on monday he's like hey are you gonna send me your resume i'm like oh yeah sure and um and that, you know, I still was auditioning a lot, but what I found it was driving under the Fox lot every day and then getting to know the people in the archives and the vault team and um, working for the home entertainment and working with marketing. And I just started to really um, love the uh, that side of things and it rekindled my interest in physical media. And once 4K came out, I was like, you know, at first I was like, oh God, another format. And, and it, I think the first 4K they showed us, they demoed for us was The Martian. And um, 
I was like, yeah, okay, cool. Like it's a new movie, you know, and I thought it looks good. Like, you know, and then it wasn't until I think we did, uh, I remember we did, I did Die Hard. And then I think it was when I did Predator because I knew how horrendous that Blu-ray looked. And when I did, um, got a check disc for the 4K of uh, Predator after I was working on it. And um, a colleague of mine went into the the big room with all the setup and watched it. And we were both like, ah. Oh. And then from then on, I was um, <laughs> sold on the the 4K format, and then became a big um, proponent uh, and advocate for getting more catalog out. And then the merger happened, and tried that at Disney for a little while with limited success. Yeah, I want to talk about all of that, but for, first yeah. of all, so how do you, you know, because you work on this stuff, you work on the actual discs. You, you it is the technical side. Yeah, the yeah. Authoring, yeah. How do you feel when people say? It's all a gimmick. 4K is a gimmick. It's no better. They're just trying to sell you the disc again. You know, that's a that's a conversation. I'm yeah. all the time. You know, I'm I'm constantly reviewing new 4Ks and talking about stuff. And like at least every video, there's at least one guy who's like, mm -hmm. nah, it's all it's I can't see a difference. And I'm like, what? But I would like to know what you think, because you're actually making this stuff. Yeah, I, I mean, I obviously I'm a huge um film film guy. I I love I love movies. To me, it's like I think people, when it's the TV is probably configured, if they actually, I mean, look, some people just don't care. Um, and they're going to watch films on their phones. They don't, they don't, uh, they don't mind. Like they're the TV's default with the motion smoothing and the shutter reduction and everything. And to me, makes everything look either like it was shot on an iPhone or early HD cam or a video game. And some people, that's just now how their eyes are trained. And um, for me, that just spent most of my movie watching as a as a kid was. Uh, at the theater watching film at the movies um so to me it looks like a pristine film print it's i think it's more it's i to me i think it's a little um i've looked at some you know new films that have had like a blu-ray release and like even when i was a fox and compared it to the uhd and i was like uh, you know but i think when it's a film print anything pre-2010 uh to me i think if it's done right you can see a substantial um mm -hmm. substantial difference in um in the quality and uh to me that's always exciting is when um you know when they've done this you know restoration or this new scan um how it turns out and I mean, for me it became like getting to know the restoration team at fox i was always really interested in especially if it's a film that i loved um you know when they would uh screen it on the fox lot um the new transfer like when they did screen speed which is a you know i was um 14 when that came out so it was a huge part of my teenage years and um I knew that Jan de Bont had been, um, you know, supervising that and he was a cameraman. And um, so he just, to me, did an absolute, like, phenomenal job. The movie just looked incredible. And then it became me uh, pushing them to put it out on disc, you know, and then um, working with trying to get Disney to put it out. And eventually they did. So, yeah. But, I, I mean, I don't, I don't, look, I don't try to convince people of anything anymore. I'm just, I feel like, you know, some even like even my husband, he's he if he's seen a film a lot and you know it's one of his favorites, you'll see it on 4K, he does get excited. He'll be like, he's not even a cinema, he's not a big movie guy. He'll be like, Oh, this looks really cool. I've never noticed that before. Uh noticing, especially like things like on the set, you know, set decoration or textures and costumes and things like that. You can just tell it's just it's more dynamic. Um, but uh, people again, some just don't see it and also don't care, and that's totally there right you know I mean, it is but i just wonder like what how does it feel because you're when you make something like you just worked on the um the abyss and true lies right and then that mm -hmm. comes out and there's like controversy like why does there have to be controversy about everything but yeah a lot like, of talk about those discs yeah just and just for context i don't work for disney anymore i was working at one of the authoring houses um and I've done a whole multitude of different um releases both for warner brothers um disney and also criterion and um i think uh like i get it i mean to me to me like working on that those discs you know there were there were, there were 100 discs they weren't the smaller one but it's like it's the visual side of it like that's a that's a filmmaker's choice and um is it what i would like it to look uh probably not um i i, I do you know i i I remember when we first looked at the the transfer of, of True Lies, and of course I'm not going to say anything to anyone. Just, but I just was I was disappointed because um, I think that's 
you know, what is uh, restoration when they're doing an HDR color grade, which is kind of revisionist anyway, how far do you go? Um, to me, what I like about this format is I want it to look like the best possible representation of how it looked on the film negative. Um, and anything beyond that, um, it's too overly processed. At this. It's just, um, it, it's, not, it's not for me. It seems like sometimes, like some of these guys, I think of George Lucas, I think of uh, James Cameron, and look, we're not bashing anybody, but I feel Um, like they, I'm just guessing, I feel like they don't like the look of film. Like film comes with inherent imperfections that I think they have been trying to overcome for decades now. And I think now they see this technology that can strip all that away. And they're like, finally, I can have this clean digital thing. But Yeah. I, that's not what I like the American graffiti uh, 4K. It's so clean. And I'm like, no, this isn't how American graffiti Yeah. has ever looked before. Yeah, But now I, it's I crazy. agree. Like, again, is it is it too much of a, um, is it a, a more of a just, they, they want the film to look modern, that again, it's their film, it's their choice, or do they just, do they think the idea of 4K is to make it look like it was shot on digital and have no grain whatsoever? I, I think like, That I bring up speed again, but if you look at, um, I think the interesting thing about comparing that to True Lies is that they were both released by Fox in the same year and just whether or not you like the True Lies transfer or not, um, it, it's like you can look at, to me, look at the speed and look at uh, True Lies and you can just see the, the approach by how the 4K was done was with a completely different intention. Um, and um, and DeBond is supervised, so he shot them. Um, Joel Schumacher's Flatliners and did that for Arrow Video. He's subsequently done The Haunting and um, has done Twister now. And I think that he really, to me, gets um, what, how these films are, you know, getting the best out of how it was shot versus Lucas, uh, any of the others. Um, I would be curious to see how Seven turns out and how Fincher approaches his films. Um, but again, I think it just goes down to the intent. Um, they used an this kind of AI technology for the Lightstorm titles. And um, that was what, that's how they approached it. And, um, <laughs> you know, um, so, and there's a lot of people that really like it and they're really, really happy with it. And for all the That's work great. that it took to get those out, the, the meetings and just unarchiving all of the um, bonus content um, took a lot of work and a lot of hours. It was um, that they were, Everyone that worked on that, uh, especially in the authoring side and making those discs, it, um, it, I'd never worked on anything like it. It was it was crazy. Yeah, Oh, wow. yeah. Well, it's just so much material, you know. And we're you Yeah. know looking at what was on the laser disc and what was on the um, the Blu-rays and and I think that you know when studios go through mergers and things like that, you know, it's assets and that you know pull over from Fox Vault into another vault, and it's just it, it can be hard to find. find everything but they did um and um you know and even going back to the other previous formats and what's missing and and you know for like even disney to me at least like they really were intentional about trying to get as much on these releases to make them as definitive as possible and um and i think that's that and that's not what i do that's the whole disney team that just makes those decisions and what's going to go on the disc and even when they did speed on 4k i was really happy that they um They, you know, the Fox Blu-ray had no extras on it um, and they pulled all the DVD extras back on it and really, to me, made a definitive release of that film. So, yeah. I want to talk more about that, but first let's, what is, let's explain to people what, um, like what exactly when a disc is encoded, when a disc is authored, what does that mean? Cause there's going to be people who don't know what that is. Yeah, right. Um, so... First of all, I am not, an, I'm not an encoder. I work with the encoders. They're the, the geniuses that do all that. And I'm also not an author. So I, what I do as a title or project manager is I get the whole title and I'm, you know, everything from the subtitling to the menus. I have a timeline and I'm working with everyone, not only to um, triage any problems that come up, but also get everything together. But um, so when we get the, uh, so the UHD master, for a, a title, um, the encoder will then have to encode it for disc. And then that, what happens is we'll look at the spec and what's going to be on it, what, what audio is on it, whether it's Atmos, does it have a commentary, um, menus and everything like that, how long is the film? And then we'll come out with um, bit rates to decipher what disc size it should go on. Um, 
somewhere like Criterion is always generally going to do the, the higher level. Um, and then it, it just becomes every studio has got their level of what is an acceptable bit rate, but it's around the same range. Um, and uh, the encoder will then encode the film and uh, get it to the author. And then um, the author does their work of authoring, encompassing all the assets and writing the disc essentially. Um, so in terms of the technical side of it, I've never done it myself. I have watched it happen, but like there's still, you know, I've been doing this for years. And sometimes if we have like an issue with a with an encode, is it from the encoding process or is it from the source, which is the UHD source they sent us? And um, sometimes we can re-encode portions of the film and um, splice it in. And uh, it's uh, and it takes a long time. Like to an encoder, a UHD uh, feature can, you know, can take up to two days, um, even longer than that to, from, to do the entire film. So the, pro the process is broken up into several steps and uh, we just had a project where it was probably very problematic. And um, I learned a lot from that in terms of like, why can't you just leave this overnight, run it over the weekend? It's like, you know, I got to like come in, I got to check this bit and then I got to, you know, do the next several hours. I got to come in and check it. And um, so, but it, like, make no mistake, like it may, for every, like everyone looks at this stuff, but like everyone is working to, make it at the highest level possible under the realms of also when you're on the authoring side, what the client wants, which is the studio as well. So, um, but yeah, um, it's, it's all these elements coming together and, um, and timing it. And it's for my job, it's always like a race against time and a clock and everything. Like I'm always my clock, I have a time clock for London, New York here. And, um, it's a lot. Um, yeah. yeah. Yeah, the reason I wanted to talk about that is because there's always, you know, I in in my role here, people, I tend to be almost like a middleman. And pe I hear all these complaints, or maybe it's not a complaint, but people will say, like, why can't they just put such and such out on a disc? You just slap it on a disc, and there it is. I'm like, that's not how that works. So I kind of wanted to hear your... Yeah, right. Well, like, even I think if there are, look, there are cheaper ways to work, um, around doing these 4k transfers and even an HDR that that is a fact um but the reality of the studio look but the point of it is not also just to put it on disc uh it's also for archival purposes as well um like um pretty, and a good example is I would really love um an HD release of um Star Trek Deep Space Nine they did next generation I would love that was my show, um, but the visual effects on that show are rendered in SD. And I've seen now YouTube people on YouTube like do their own upresing and that, and I think it looks pretty good. The visual effects look good, you know, and um, and you know the studio would never allow that. It would not pass their own standard for archival purposes because it's not a true, um, it's not a, a true uh, scan from the original film elements. If you're looking at archiving, um, it's that's not going to work. The visual effects would have to be redone. It would cost millions, and um, you know for depending on the the film and the condition that it's in like something like um uh, say a film let me just pull something out I don't know, like twister for example uh might not be as intricate as doing something like casablanca where i know uh, when i interviewed the colorist for the academy they had to piece that film together from elements all around the world um but it costs a lot like i think um there's a i won't say which one but there's a specific animated film that you know costs just under a million dollars just for the hdr alone so um that's just the hdr element not the actual scan of the negative so you're looking at like several hundred thousand dollars just to create the uhd transfer alone and then um then you've got the whole making the disc itself and even that is is costly um and uh it, it's like you know pe people that make these discs like we have to, all have to try and we're trying to make make a living and and i can see like even based on sales figures when i've talked to people from the studios and that um they're not breaking even on some some they a lot they are but they they're trying to find ways to to break even paramount's doing a really good job at optimizing their catalog and um even licensing them out which uh you know helps them uh keep their uh their vault up to date with you know the best assets possible but um it's not the the decision to do a uh uhd is not always about doing a retail version it, it can and sometimes the decision is specifically for retail because that will offset the losses from ones that they feel like compelled to do because 
you know, even like restoring like all the Shirley Temple films, uh, if they want to keep that for archival reasons, because obviously it's like so iconic, chances are it's not going to make it onto 4K or, and I'm just using that as an example. I don't know if they've done the Shirley Temple films, but they are <laughs> archived. I'm sure they have. But I, they're doing these specifically for archival purposes, um, primarily. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, you were at Fox for what, about four and a half years, something like that? Yeah, yeah. I started in 2015. Um, Disney came in in 2019 uh, and um, they didn't actually get to, you know, it takes a lot to move through a company following a merge, once they merge or a takeover like that. But so we were kind of left alone for... Um, A year it wasn't until right before the pandemic hit that they started to really get in and vet home entertainment because also where i was working which is the technical side um it was really important just you have to keep all of these the mastering happening there's contracts and that for tv shows to keep happening and everything had to keep moving so they just kind of left us alone um but yeah it was good it was a good time Well, that's, that's how, talk to me about the environment. I'm trying to phrase this question in the least salacious way possible. I'm just curious about that transition from Fox into Disney and what the environment was like inside. If it was like, was it traumatic or was it like, okay, how, like, how did it go? Uh, well, look, uh, this is not specific to the Disney Fox. I have now, people in my life have gone through these huge mergers, even outside of the entertainment industry. If you, To me, the lesson is if you're the side being acquired, you're going to have it the roughest um, because whatever you've cultivated or created is usually, I think, um, kind of, it's, 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 it's devalued, right? So everyone puts, you know, their effort into... Um, into a into their jobs or uh, or has pride in their work and I mean as I think the one thing I love why I loved going to Fox is just how um proud everyone was to work there I call it the I call it the blue collar studio because I felt like it was it was very relaxed um but that you know we had like a lot of we had IPs the way that Disney had IP but we had kind of the The, the grittier ones, you know, we had the diehard aliens and predator. And even when it came to comic films, like when we did Deadpool, it was like, yeah, we're doing the, you know, we're doing the cool stuff. Like another fact that Marvel's not cool, but it was just like, this is the edgier version. Like when Logan came, we're always just, um, and I think even like in terms of someone that loves storytelling and uh, that's why I became an actor originally out of all the studios, I think Fox was the last one that was really taking calculated risks you know for 24 films a year they released between 20th century and also searchlight i think only five were ip so you're looking at well over a dozen original films a year where every other studio was not doing that and um there was def it was definitely look it was a sad time um because you saw systematically um just sort of things being uh shut down you know you hear of people that getting getting laid off. And, you know, the thing that I just noticed on my side was the, um, the, the, the discs, uh, what we could and couldn't spend started to change. You know, what we had like Fox had a mandatory director's commentary on all our new release films. Even if the film didn't do well, at the box office, they were still going to put it, have the director in for a commentary. And that was something that was put into question. Uh, once the department adjacent to us, we had Disney move in. It was like a lot of questions started coming in. Like, why are we spending this? Why are we doing this? And, um, you know, and it, it, look, it was, you just see everything start to get flat, you know, all of a sudden there's no screenings on the lot anymore. We had like, every time we released a movie on a Friday, they would screen that film at lunch times on a Friday. Um, there would be the restoration team would do Fox movie night and screen, like, uh, like the abyss in 70 millimeter or, or, um, you know, some either a restored film or an old film from an original film print. Um, it was, uh, so it, it wasn't fun. And then we, then you just, you were in this waiting game where we waited for like a year um, before, um, before Disney uh, kind of came in, we got our new bosses and, um, you know, we were all essentially those that they decided to keep myself included were put onto uh, Disney plus and, uh, but I on the side had already been talking to, Disney's uh, products team about doing more um, Fox titles in 4K and uh, got to, you know, was like, we should do more. And there it's, we, I got to do Home Alone and Hocus Pocus. And um, then it was pretty much 
I was going to do speed and unbreakable next. And they were like, no, you're doing Disney plus. And, um, and it's interesting. I don't have anything, I don't have anything. I, I, you know, streaming is not my preferred format. It's just not as fun to work on for me. Um, so I, um, I resigned and then, uh, but that look, it was, was not easy. <laughs> it's, um, it's never fun. It's like, it's just because, and I think even from people that I've spoken to on the other side too, like, it's like, what is, what is happening? Cause it's like, it's such a huge, like, you're taking on a studio, an 80 year old studio and tons of assets, tons of TV content. Fox had such a huge amount of television content in production. Um, forget like just even the old film assets just, and then films that were in production. Um, yeah, it was a lot. It definitely, I, I, you know, I'll always remember that time, but um, I just, I remember the good times more. <laughs> yeah. Well, and the, yeah. the, the scary thing about, what you just said is that a lot of those Fox movies and shows are nowhere now. They're not on physical. They're not even on streaming or any of the digital platforms. They just vanished. And I guess there's a plan for them or there will be a plan for them at some point. I, I mean, I hope, but for now things just disappeared and they've been just, they've, they've been gone for a few years now. Yeah, no, you're, you're exactly right. I mean, I do, I, I started like compiling like a spreadsheet of, uh, all the, the films that I couldn't find. And, um, uh, it's just, I think that look, and I don't think it's different at Disney than any other studio. When you have a, a problem that, uh, well, a challenge, I'll say like, like the streaming platforms that aren't bringing in the revenue that they need to bring and you're operating at a loss. Um, it's, uh, even if like something like even in your physical media arm, if they were to license out content and it might make them an extra couple of million, that's not going to make up for the billions, you know, that they are having to put into the, these platforms. And um, I would say that like, it, you know, the, every company starting to run leaner and leaner and it takes a, um, it takes a village to um, maintain all that. And I think even just historical awareness of the studios in general, aside from a couple, I think is a problem too. I don't, I don't think that there is enough uh, staff uh, that are aware of not only the, the library, but also the, uh, the cultural value of some of these films. Um, mm -hmm. And uh, with a couple of the studios, I've bought up titles and um, would you do that in 4K? And some of the people I'm talking to don't even know what the film is. And um, yep. some of them are my age or a bit younger, some are a bit older. And it's, um, like we're in the film business, you know, uh, I think that, that, I think it, I think it does matter. It doesn't even have to be an expert, but I think even if you don't like the film, like so many films that I push for 4k, I don't personally like, but I do, I'm aware of their value culturally that there's a, a market for it. And, um, it's, it's, if I was working at a studio and, and hiring in that, I would do some kind of at least one or two questions on the legacy of that studio, just to see if the person I'm hiring is aware of, um, what's important about it because every studio does have its own legacy so yeah i've heard horror stories it's all off the record but i've heard horror stories about hey what if we put out this and they're like i don't know what that is or like mm -hmm. who is humphrey bogart it's like that kind of a thing just using it as an example like these icons of cinema they're like i'm not i'm not familiar who is that again scary scary yeah. stuff and in, in the terms yeah. of film history and film literacy film literacy yeah. is getting further and further uh a field from us how do you feel about you know you've been in the industry for a long time how how's it going right now you know after the pandemic and with all these acquisitions and the mergers uh i sometimes can feel very discouraged about the direction things are going but i'm what do you think about where things are going yeah i've had it i've had one of those weeks recently actually yeah. um uh it's um look i i I try to focus on where I'm seeing, uh, where I'm seeing good work. And I do know that there are still like what I said earlier in that, like, I can't, I, you know, we, it's easier to generalize today. Um, when you look at the overall scope of things, obviously the landscape is changing. Um, I'll talk about films in general in a second, but for, I do try to lean into where I'm seeing, um, people doing really good work and I'm lucky at my job with, uh, where I, where I'm working now, I've just started, um, and the the boutique label I'm working with, they they really really care, and I'm working on films that really matter. Um, and also, I know you had Todd from Paramount on your um, show. Uh, he to me is doing incredible work and has um, a really solid awareness of um, 
of legacy titles and even just in terms of optimizing as i said that catalog just to like oh you know we don't necessarily we will license this one out and um we get a 4k of changing lanes or indecent proposal and everything like that like it's to me that's incredibly smart and um they get a licensing fee so they're bringing in revenue um so there are people that are doing really great work and that are aware um but overall it's it's like there's so much happening from so many different angles um and i can you know at different times i can see oh that's because of this and that's because of that and uh, i think covid had a huge um impact um on uh how we consume content i think that uh streaming has eroded uh audiences uh reverence for films um when you think about the intentionality of getting off your butt and going down to a movie theater or even going down to blockbuster with your with your kids or with your your partner and renting a movie and you take that home and you're invested in that movie. And even if it sucked, chances are you still watch the damn thing, you know, and then you'd tell everyone, oh God, did you see um, whatever it is, Basic Instinct 2? <laughs> it's, like, it's like, oh God, I don't know. And, um, and but you're still talking about it, right? And now um, we're just, uh, there's, I don't feel like that the, the thumbnail is just a, a, an abyss of, thumbnails on your tv screens resonates in terms of um the, the quality of the piece of content or the film it doesn't really sell it the way that a film used to be sold i think that um these are also um distracting us from um we're so like just we're so triggered by the phones and everything and i you know i'd say i've seen a lot of friends even as soon as they hit play on something they pick up their phone and start reading an article and i'm like So our, our focus and attention spans, I think our reverence for film in general, um, you know, we used to pay for a movie on a per title basis, right? Even if you're renting it from Blockbuster and now it's just funneled into this monthly subscription. Um, you can't, it, it, to me, that's a big, big part of it. And then the studios being swallowed up by the big, uh, these other big conglomerates, um, the, the fact that a streaming platform survival um, is... is is paramount over everything else um again like uh, you're they've cannibalized their own revenue stream from theatrical to home entertainment uh digital purchase it's just everything's gotten shorter and um the only way to um reverse this is like and also then you've got the storytelling itself which i don't think has uh it doesn't you know when a film makes an impact like the way that whether you like them or not Oppenheimer or Barbie did last year to me that reminded me of um you know when I was growing up in the 90s you know and even Barbie had like pop songs with it you'd hear on the radio you know <laughs> like and that was this thing where it felt like an event um and I was like oh this is interesting it, it like but there's so much I think that there's also that political side to Hollywood now it's in its own bubble and I don't I think that uh um there's people that are turned off by the, a lot of the messaging and um, that, that they're putting in the storytelling. And it's because I don't feel like it is, um, it, it's always, it's, it's promoting this kind of tribalism. And I, I always wanted diversity. I always want diversity and inclusivity in, in my storytelling. But I look at a film like um, when I grew up, like Philadelphia um, with Tom Hanks and Denzel Washington, which for many people was their first uh you know, seeing a story about um, the, the AIDS epidemic. And what is interesting, I think if that film came out today, it would be very politicized. And I don't think in the 90s when people saw that, anyone was thinking who was right, who was left, who was gay, who was straight, who was black, who was white. They just saw a human being uh, who had, um, has a disease, who was fighting, who was unfairly dismissed from their job. Um, and deserve justice. And that story in itself brings audiences together. And um, there's been so much um, messaging, I think, that has been to the expense of the other, or that these this group is bad and these group is, I don't know, it's, it's uh, like I said, it's so multifaceted. Um, and uh, it, it um, I, I think there's no easy solution. <laughs> I'll say that. But I, and I don't know if young people even, Uh, you know, I'm 44 soon, and I don't know if young people, you know, movies were were king when I grew up. You know, even if you weren't a cinephile, chances are in high school you'd take your date out to a movie, you know, and um, or you'd at least watch them. You know, um, I don't know if it, if younger generations revere it as much. So I think the studios are really 
struggling. They're struggling how to make revenue from this streaming platform. They're struggling in terms of um, how to do storytelling. And I think there's a huge cultural disconnect from um, main street, the main, just the outside of the Hollywood bubble that I think um, is turning people away. That was a long answer. Sorry. That was a <laughs> good answer, though, because you hit, I mean, you hit a lot of stuff there and it's all true. I, you know, we're the same age, too. And I remember taking dates to movies or even to, like the movies were something to do at the time. Now, we had video games, obviously, but video games now make like billion. I mean, video games now are you've got so I many movies are now competing with video games. They're comp in a way like never before. They're competing with TikTok. They're competing with YouTube. You know, they're competing with all these other things that I feel like like I, I have a teenager and I just look at how she spends her time and it's not it's not on movies. You know, she'll watch Yeah. a movie every now and then, Yes, but yeah. there it's not a movie culture anymore. And I Mm I -hmm. are we the last generation that has a movie culture? I, I think maybe we are. Well, I don't, yeah, I don't think they're going to go away, but I, I mean, look, we're already seeing post strikes as well, like uh, that there's been a reduction in, um, in production. Um, and I think that uh they've realized that this just dumping is so much content on streaming is not the answer because it get, everyone's just so overwhelmed. Like I, even when I, I genuinely want to watch so many movies and TV shows and I look at what's, I'm like, I just don't have the time. The backlog just gets bigger and bigger till it falls into a, a obscurity and I just never get back to it. Um, so they're starting to cut back and um, I don't know if we'll ever go back to the way that it used to be, but I don't think it'll necessarily go anywhere. The, the question will be, I think we'll see losses of more studios and more mergers. I think it will get more consolidated. I think we'll see streaming platforms. I mean, I think I already heard of potentially it was at Paramount and Peacock, Paramount Plus and Peacock potentially rolling into each other. Um, we'll see more of that um, because they're just not sustainable as they are uh, for whatever you can't have, like a film like Die Hard, uh, sorry, like um, Top Gun Maverick or, Barbie that you know makes so much money and then you're operating your streaming platforms losing lots like so much money the way that it is it's just I, I but I do think that young people obviously they they will go out and see a movie when but for the, they're they've got to really want to see it it's and I and I think about what really made us get out and see it well we didn't have phones for starters but I felt like movies used to feel like they were an event. And um, like I said about the pop song, like I, I, so many times, like I'll hear a song and I'm like, it reminds me of a time when a movie was out. Cause that was the the theme from that movie. And it feels like a seasonal event, like this, you know, this big summer movie and it's got, a, you know, a song and um, someone was talking about kiss from a rose the other day. And it was like, yeah, that was the Batman forever summer, whether or not you like the film. The point is I remember that, season so with the u2 song and everything it just felt like this event um and everyone wanted to be a part of it but Do we talk about um Celine Dion and the theme from Titanic? My heart will go on. I mean, yes it was everywhere. It was like every five yeah minutes. yeah and she did one for up close and personal with robert redford and michelle pfeiffer which i've never seen that movie but i know that song was from that film and also look streaming as well um even if you look at television we used to uh You know, we're all on the same schedule, you know. Yeah, we used to sometimes have to, you know, record an episode of something if we're out or whatever. But, you know, I remember going to school and everyone was talking about last night's X-Files or last night's Simpsons or Seinfeld. And that conversation is now gone because we're very much just isolated in our own bubble. And again, this this separatism that's kind of happening where... It's it's really weird to just talk with people and like, are you have you watched blah blah blah? And they're like, no, we're watching this. And it's like, cool, end of conversation. Like, you know, either I've never heard of it or people don't have that platform or there's and I think that again, the there's a vision that's happened. Again, it's just another way that people are just being pulled apart. Whereas the it used to bring people together um, for a collective experience, even if you were in your living room. you knew that your, you know, your friends were also watching uh, Sex in the City or something, you know, like that night and going to talk about whatever it is. Um, and that to me is also a big part of it is that they've lost the ability to kind of really bring, um, bring the culture and community together. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, let's talk about happier things as we wind down because our we're 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 wrapping it up. But what are do you have favorites of your projects of the things you worked on? Do you have things that stand a little higher than others? Oh, favorites. Um, 
pick your children. Yeah, my children. I loved doing the 4K Predator set. Um, I really liked, I worked on that. That was really good, good fun. I mean, because just those, you know, I just thought getting those films out and they all, all those transfers looked really cool. They look good. And uh, um, I, what else? What else? Um, there's a bunch of, of course, like for, for, for Criterion that I've worked on that I think were really, really good fun. Um, I did like doing the Wally release. Um, I thought because it was just such a cheeky thing for them to do to put Wally in the Criterion collection and uh, Raging Bull. Um, in terms of my time at Fox, God, it's going back now, there were like new release films. Like I really liked, um, it's a really solid transfer. I, I, Bad Times of the El Royale, I think is a really great 4K disc. Um, yes, it is. Yeah. I and love if that anyone's one. watching hasn't seen it, it's worth checking out. Like that was again a film where I'm watching it on the Fox lot when it came out before it came out. And I'm like, I love that we're doing this because yeah. it's just a it's a film that you just don't see get a theatrical release. And it's like, I you know, and I, I get it. It was really beautifully shot. It was had great actors and um and I, I loved loved working on that. Um I did die hard. That was great to work on. Our Deadpool 2, um, that was a fun release. It was a beast. I remember working on that. Um but yeah, it's I've worked on so many now. I've never done a count. I'm sure I've probably worked on getting under 200 titles now. Um so I'll probably get off this call now and I'll think of oh I forgot about yeah. that one. Oh, um oh, but like, it's that one. It's definitely that one. It's that one. Yeah. Um yeah, but I just um, wanted you to talk about your work, really. I wanted to, to hear what some of your highlights. Yeah, are. I mean, it's always good when I feel like the people are excited. Like sometimes I'll know about a title even months in advance, and it's fun to see it when it gets announced and just to scope out what people are writing on Twitter or or on you know. I I don't post on message boards, but I just read them <laughs> to me what uh what what people are writing. It's for the most part people are really excited, and um and that's always great um and i i think that this is still a really great time if you're a collector because we're getting films like thanks to thanks to arrow and Keener and shout uh we're getting films that so you know i know that there are more important films that should have a 4k release that perhaps some studios are holding on to um but we're still even to get if you're a fan of uh, i mentioned uh changing lanes or indecent proposal if you're a fan of them you can get it on 4k and um so I think it's a really, really exciting time. I still enjoy doing it, um, you know, and it's fun even to write for the Academy and, you know, for their digital publication about these releases and, you know, why they're important. And the Academy doesn't care if they're Oscar nominated or not. They see the value. And sometimes I'll say, I want to cover this film. And they're, they're like, cool. And I'm like, oh, great. You know, <laughs> like, I, 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 yeah, like it's, um, it's, 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 it's all good. Um, How can but, people I mean, read me, those? Your, your articles for the Academy. How can people read those? Yeah, they're, they're, we're cutting back a little bit. Uh, I did, I was doing one a month, um, just a 4K roundup. It's on the digital publication called A-Frame. And uh, it was it was really fun to be able to you know research not only the the restoration but also just kind of give a bit of an outline as to why the film's important and what you know why it's worth maybe adding to your collection and um, and then I've been able to interview um, filmmakers too so uh, I've interviewed the director of the Fugitive and and it's always usually to talk about the 4K release um, the three directors of the Prince of Egypt or Henry Selick I talked to about Nightmare Before Christmas and um, yeah it's 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 all good I. Like if you're sometimes I do feel like, oh, I could maybe just be a collector, you know, because it, it's 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 a lot. It's a lot when you're in this business, it just it is continually moving. You know, from my perspective, there's so many discs coming out all the time because I look at my schedule and I'm like, oh, you know, uh, and you know, so sometimes I need a break from it. And um, <laughs> I like I don't look at my collection, you know, but um. I don't know, I'm proud to be a part of it because, at the, at, again, at this time where, as you said, there are films that are falling off streaming, they're not available on digital. And uh, it's good to be a part of, I think, the side of it of just if, if you're a fan or for the public to have access to it. Um, I think that's important. The availability of these films are, is really important. So, yeah, for me, for me, it's all good. I, it's a nice little niche to have, um, you know, fallen into and um, just 
just I was like, what am I doing here? And I was like, just trusting, you know, <laughs> because I, uh, working at Fox was a real um, was a real blessing for me, and um, there were good people there. It was a fun fun studio, and then it just it kick started this whole other career for me that that I really enjoy. So I guess this is my final question. People are always talking about physical media. We're always talking about the health of physical media. Um, one of the things that we kind of hit on earlier is the, well, there's a little bit of a social media problem, I think, right now, where releases that are worked on for weeks or months and that are planned meticulously and that, you know, you've put a lot of effort into bringing across the finish line can sometimes get nitpicked to death. And I'm curious, you know, I see this a lot in what I do because it doesn't, it's like, we have this great library of cinema at our fingertips at all times. And I feel like sometimes we lose the plot on that as someone who makes this stuff. Do you have any thoughts about maybe fan perception of these releases? Um, yeah, well, look, I think everyone obviously wants everything to be perfect and the, the, you know, the best it can be. And, uh, I, like from where I work and the people that I work with, whether it's at the old, the authoring house I used to work at or where I'm starting at now, um, it's like everyone is out to do the best possible work. And I think, uh, it, again, it's, I don't know if it lends itself just to being on Twitter and social media, but I find it doesn't matter whether it's physical media, people are very quick to point out and uh, focus on uh, focus on something that isn't successful or or someone's failure or, uh, and it's, it's kind of fascinating to me to look, because I obviously following all these studios and the authoring house I used to work with serviced all the, um, studios and uh, being aware of um, the releases and sometimes it is because the source is in really bad shape and the transfer might if it's a 4k transfer might turn out to be a bit disappointing and it's fascinating that then that because of that one release when a, a studio like announces subsequent releases I see these kind of comments focusing on that one release from a year ago or several months ago and it's like well this is a different film element. It's um, it's like, I find that like for this, I'm going to focus on this. And yet the, the evidence is like this, that they've done this much great work, but there's still this kind of focus on that. And like, look at looking behind you, like there is so much um, excellence on that wall. And uh, yeah, I've had, I've definitely encountered transfers that I'm just like, Oh, that's not, just disappointing but i'm glad i own it. it's the best the film's ever going to look is that what i would settle for no and i would argue that uh most of the the releases that i do see are pretty exceptional um and uh yeah it's just it's a, it's an interesting thing for me uh that i i see online and i had someone recently actually on uh on twitter um who i've been talking to for quite a few years and really pounced on something that uh, an article that I posted uh, Jerry Seinfeld had uh, written and and they were arguing uh, at this very minute part of the article. And I'm like, great. I said, but he's also talking about this. And they were still like, and I said, but with the, the grand scheme of things, it's this. And I was very like, just chill about it. Like I wasn't even like, I was like, yeah, it's just like having a conversation. I know this person through social and then all of a sudden just blocked me. <laughs> it's like, oh, um, and again, like, I, I think that we can have discourse and, and talk about it and yeah, express disappointment. But I also think that if we focused as much on celebrating how amazing something is <laughs> as we do as how maybe disappointing something is, I think that you'd find that the good stuff definitely outweighs the, um, the bad. So that's why I'm usually when I do watch something, that I think is great, whether it's from Paramount or from Sony, I'm like, this transfer is amazing. It's, it's, it's exceptional. And, and it's, it's crazy to me as well. Like, well, not crazy, but just shows as well, like how a release can, a catalog title can come out and it comes out and I'm like, this looks, this is an amazing transfer. And the, you know, the reaction is just kind of, eh, like uh, a good example. I know it got on a few best of lists, but um, Barry Sonnenfeld's The Addams Family, like that is my go-to reference disc and everyone's like, huh? And I'm like, like that film was shot on sets, the textures on that film, on the costumes and the set. And he personally supervised that transfer during the pandemic when he had nothing else to do. The HDR is flawless. It is an absolutely flawless uh, 4K transfer. And I, and it came out and I was like, it's so good. No one was talking about it. <laughs> and it's like, oh, um, 
so again, I just, I, I would encourage people if you see, you know, transfers that you love or releases that you love to, to talk about it, post it, celebrate it. And if you don't like the transfer, don't, you know, start, have discourse, but don't like, you know, just bring someone down for liking something that we're supposed to like, you know, like the whole point of these is where, so, but anyway, yeah. It's entertainment at the end of the day, right? It's not like Right. Yeah. another war. Yeah. It's inter politics. It's just entertainment. Yeah. Yeah. I, I just, sometimes I see there's like the, the announcements. I look in the comments, well, because of this title, I'm going to wait till I see the reviews. And I'm like, this label has done dozens of incredible transfers in the last, like in the last couple of years. And because of that one title, all of a sudden they're, they're done for you. It's, it's really interesting. Um, and I think that, you know, just got to just breathe and just, you know, um, just keep it all in perspective. And um, so anyway, yeah. Tell people where they can follow you. Where do you want them to go check you out on social media, websites, things Yeah. like that? Yeah, just my initials on, on Twitter. I'm AJ Yeend, A-J-Y-E-E-N-D. Uh, and I'm on Instagram too. I do post movie stuff on there and um, other random, random life LA stuff. But um, yeah, Twitter, if you want to talk to me about uh, physical, that's pretty much the way to go. It's not, sorry, X, Twitter X. Um, that's where you'll find me. So Is there anything you're working on right now that you want to tease or that you want people to be paying attention to? Oh, actually, there is. Uh, no, I can't say. <laughs> Okay. I can't say. Something Actually, there good. is some. I bet it's really good. There's some really cool stuff. I mean, so I mean, I don't. I can't. Really, I don't want to say like which where I'm specifically working right now, but um, they, they've already announced a couple of them, and it's been really encouraging to see how um excited people are that I, I can see much further down the list, and um, and I'm I'm like, oh, okay. Uh, so yeah, there's there's still good stuff. Um, and I know the studios, uh, you know, my friends at the studios and that are still working on really, there's some cool things coming out. So, um, I think we're still at a really, really good time, uh, for releases and, um, yeah, everyone just keep loving it, keep posting it. So, yeah. Great. Adam, thanks so much for coming to talk to me about this stuff. This was a blast. Yeah. Heath, you're awesome. Thank you for having me on all the best. Cheers.